the Gyan program on speciation and the web of life. And the Gyan program, as you, some of you might know, is an initiative taken by Ministry of Human Resource Development in Delhi to promote interactions at the international level between the scientific community, especially faculty and students. So the main speaker is going to be Professor Mike Arnold, who is going to be here throughout the program with us. And we are really grateful to him for accepting our invitation to spend a few weeks with us. More importantly, this Gyan program, I want you to use the opportunity to develop networks. That's a very important thing. That is the main objective of the initiative. And thanks to initiative taken by Hama Madam, and also continued support from our director, Professor Ramakrishnan. This initiative was started one year ago. Now we are here in this room. It took almost like one year to plan, get the funding, and get right dates with our main speaker. <laughs> so I invite uh, our director to formally start the program by giving, by addressing the participant. Thank you. Good morning to all of you and Professor Arnold, my colleagues from School of Biological Sciences. Uh, it gives me immense pleasure to take part in the third, am I correct, third Gyan program of our institute. In fact, among all ISOs, uh, we got the maximum. <coughs> there is always a say that uh, we don't get exposure in Indian subcontinent. Our students, our faculty lack that is, we are not properly given exposure. So the ministry thought that uh, we invite an international uh, speaker who stays with us for a whole period of the program and spends. As Murthy said, it's an interacting platform for the master student and the PhD student. Master student make use of the interaction to get their PhD fellowship. PhD students make use, makes use of it to get a postdoctoral fellowship. It is basically an exposure. That is, it's not that we are <coughs> inferior at any cost, but sometimes we require interaction, exposure, and talk to others, ventilate and uh, seasoning of scientific thoughts. So I appreciate the Dr. Hema and uh, Dr. Ulasa for making this program to be a successful one. Because I. I know Dr. Tapas and Professor Murthy contribute, write and everything in the part of the School of Biological Sciences. Of course, I don't know much about the scientific content of this program. Only one phrase I could look at it, there's a canonical literature. As a physicist, I know only canonical conjugate dynamical variable. <laughs> there is, you know, Eisenberg's uncertainty principle. If you don't know, I just I will tell you. That is, uh, you cannot measure the position and the momentum of a particle precisely. So because it's thought in the form of a wave, so uh, the position and momentum of a particle cannot be measured precisely. Like position and momentum, you have <coughs> energy and time, angular momentum and time. So position and momentum forms a dynamical variable, a conjugate dynamical variables. Mm. and energy and time forms a conjugate dynamical variables. So the error in the measurement, that's what they call delta x, is the error in the measurement of position. Delta p is the error in the measurement of momentum, linear momentum. So delta x into delta p cannot be can be greater than or equal to h cross. That is a Planck's constant. So that is the uncertainty principle. So that is, a, if you can measure only one quality at a given time. That is precisely. That is uh, what actually it tells is that you have to focus only on one single problem. Because you, if you look at a cow, you just allow it to graze, it stays to take everything on the surface. You know, it goes there, goes there, goes there, goes there. Finally, it sits someplace and uh, try to vomit like that. 
but we should not be like a cow we should just moves around and takes but we should focus on a particular problem that's ultimate meaning that uh, there should not be error in one measurement precisely for an administrator i will tell i can have only one enemy at a given time <laughs> okay so you should all enjoy in fact we wanted to have it at a permanent campus because the hostel furnishing was not ready so we could not make you to have it or could not make you to be there for this program however they think they will make arrangements for you to stay there so you have a good academic program in the meantime if you get bored nice food will be supplied <laughs> tea snacks food and entertainment will be given so you enjoy both the hospitality from our team and academic flavor from the experts okay wish you all the best thank you very much professor murthy and dr hema for inviting me many thanks uh, professor ramakrishnan uh, for spending with us a few minutes from his busy schedule we know he has been quite busy with the administrative work making the campus ready and also i must mention you as professor ramakrishnan reminder so we will take one day off to have a field trip on our campus okay hema is going to give you more information there uh, most probably she will be there to receive you so one whole day you will be spending in, in our real field okay it's going to be i said with the uh, uh permanent campus and also i must uh, mention though mike will be uh, giving most of the lectures we will have experts nationally available from premier research institutions they will be coming and spending half a day or full day with you okay with these few words i invite hama to introduce the main speaker for the program thank you all and uh, have a productive interaction good morning everyone uh, welcome to trivandrum many of you are familiar faces but there are a few of you that we haven't met as yet but uh, welcome anyway i hope you are comfortable in your hostels if there is any issue please let us know uh i'd like to welcome mike again mike has been Uh, a friend of school of biology he's been interacting with us over the last one year some of you may have attended his talk when he was here last year and since then we've been in discussion with him because he's shown immense interest in helping us develop an academic program here and this uh, gyan workshop is actually uh, you know a result of that interaction that we had with mike when he visited last year We also hope that this is not the last one and that he will continue to visit us and we have some plans for that and we hope to take this forward and have Mike here for longer durations for which we've also uh, enlisted the support of our director to help us uh, have Mike here more often. Uh to give you a very brief uh you know Mike has a very long CV but to cut a very long CV short Mike is the foremost expert in this field that you you know is a topic of this workshop uh he's the author of several books some of which we have in our library and i can see that it has been borrowed so some of you or some some people around the campus have been looking at his books so two of which are called um, evolution through genetic exchange and the other more recent one is divergence with genetic exchange uh mike had his um he's an american citizen he finished after he finished his masters in the us he moved to australia australian national university for a phd and in his phd he worked on um grasshoppers i think right or topteria and um after that he did a postdoc in louisiana state and then he took up this uh, you know uh, a faculty position at the university of georgia and he's been there since 1989 he continues to be there as a distinguished research professor at the department of genetics and evolution at the university of georgia he has made landmark contributions to the field and that is going to be obvious to you when he takes you through this course so i'm not going to say much more about his research because his uh, lectures uh, are going to speak for themselves 
of course he's been uh, you know awarded he's received several awards now from the united states as well as from places all over the world but what is most significant here is that mike is and is a very inspiring teacher and he enjoys interacting with students the younger the better you know so feel free to you know one thing that you should all be aware of is that we've tried to limit participation here to about 25 students so that there is direct one to one exchange and that you don't get lost in a big crowd so please do make use of this opportunity to talk to discuss with mike as well as with the other experts who come along don't be shy you know just you're here to learn something something that you didn't know and approach it in that spirit so with that i'd like to welcome mike again and ask him to start one thing that he asked me to remind you is that his lectures are not typical lectures it's not going to be him standing here and lecturing down to you so he expects a lot to come from your side so you need to have done your homework done your reading you know all of this in order to make this a successful course and workshop thank you and welcome again Thank you so much. Just give me a minute to get set up. Thank you. If you're already tired, feel free to stand up, jump around, get caffeine, whatever you do. To While I'm doing this, let me... Um, let me emphasize again what Hema said. Um, I am here as a your employee <laughs> in the nicest possible way I mean that. And I am here by choice um, because I love India. And my wife is here with me and she loves India. I don't know why, but we do. And uh, our last trip here, um, we this is our third trip, and um, this will be the not the longest stay. We were in Bangalore last year at the NCBS for a month, and I was doing a sort of a month-long uh, course for them, and then visited here and visited Hema and a number of folks here at Trivandrum, and then also in Pune at the ICER there. So um, next year we're hoping to come back. I've applied for a Fulbright, and we're hoping to come back for four months. Most of it's spent here, I think, uh, if, if it works out. We'll see what the Fulbright Foundation thinks. Uh, but the point of these courses for me, uh, Hema mentioned, um, I, will, I do not have, I'm supposed to, I'm going to be in front of you for 24 hours. I have nowhere near 24 hours worth of PowerPoints or anything else. Uh, the, so when I teach this particular course at my university, it's, it's a semester long. It's 15 weeks, uh, three hours a week. And it's the, exactly the same format of teaching. And that is that I get the students to read material and I ask them to ask questions. And then as we're interacting, the students will start debating with one another. No fist fights are allowed, but otherwise everything else is fine. Okay, any, any questions are appropriate. Give you an idea, the last, I just taught four, I mentioned this, I've taught four short courses, week-long short courses in China right before I came here. And the last one was in Guangzhou. One of the questions, because I mentioned that I have in my EndNote library 11,348 PDFs. Okay, journal search, I know. It's not a, I'm not bragging. I have a disease, okay, it's, it's ridiculous. But because I write a lot of reviews and some books, um, I really try to keep up with the literature. And one of the questions, they raised their hand, they were a tentative, they were a little tentative, uh, and they said, uh, it's not about the science, but could you tell me how to organize, how you organize your publications? 
what you use and how, because a number of students are starting out and we're trying to figure out how to organize these and how to maybe keep track of them. And so I say that not because you have to ask that question, you can if you want to, but rather um, that anything that you think is useful for you moving forward or analyzing data or whatever else is okay, is appropriate. Um, many times I will tell you I don't know. Okay, I'll just tell you I don't know and I may be able to send you to some literature or I may not be able to. I'm okay, I'm old, I'm 59, okay, and so I'm okay with knowing I don't know a lot of stuff. But I'll be happy to address any questions you have and we'll do it over around the, the information I've given you to read. But anything also that's related to your research or what you think you might want to do with your research, those are great questions. And this is a really nice format. Uh, these short courses are wonderful. I've taught these since 2004. I was invited to do my first one, and it, I'd never even thought about doing these. It was in Germany. And ever since that time, these have regularly I've been able to do this. And I find it's a wonderful format for me. And it seems to be a really good format for the students. But it really is going to take a lot of input, a lot of work from you. Now, let me address what I'm sure many of you are thinking right now. Yes, you are reading a ton for my stuff. You are reading so much. Sorry. You know, that's what I tell my, student, my grad students back home. Yeah, you're going to be reading for the rest of your lives if you're doing research science, so you just have to get over it. But I do know, I do understand. Uh, this last book I read, I figured out, because it has 13 or 1,400 references in it, I was digesting 200 references a month and you know, trying to summarize them and things like that. Doing well on some, not, not as great on others. So I do understand getting weary, and I understand this is uh, near reading and studying, and I do understand this is a, a really intensive time for you too. It's a short time with a lot packed into it. So I do have empathy, uh, but I can't do anything about it if I'm gonna try to expose you to some of the, some of the concepts and, and information we're going to do or cover. All right, let's see. Let's go ahead and I'll hush. Well, I won't hush, actually. Let's just go through what we're going to be doing in this course. For my, this is just mine, okay? And you have some absolutely wonderful, wonderful opportunities to hear from some fantastic research scientists here from India, okay? Hema, Krishnameg's coming in, Olasa, you know, every, all of these guys are fantastic. And if I can give a plug to you, Okay, I know before I say this, I went overseas to do my PhD and my first postdoc. And I, so I understand, and I valued that, and I still value it. But let me encourage you as evolutionary biologists and ecologists that you have some wonderful institutions in this country that are available to you. This is one of them, okay? And so I would, I would encourage you to not just look outside look inside as well. I did when I ended up overseas. I was looking within the U.S. as well. So anyway, that's just my plug. They're not paying me to tell you that. I don't get any extra things from them for saying that. I'm just, I'm just encouraging you. One of the, I mean, I love India and love being here, but I wouldn't be in a place, you know, I wouldn't be as comfortable somewhere where there weren't just really great colleagues. So realize that. Okay. So what do we have on the, I had to change these from days because I normally do them day one, day two, you know, and this is just a different format. So I changed them to, I hope I changed every one of those to sessions. But anyway, session one, which is this morning. Um, oh, Hema, Murdy, please remind me to stop. I, I'll, I'll start going and I'll forget that we have a break. I promise you I will. I'll get excited. There'll be, no, no, don't smile. This is not a good thing. I'm obsessive, okay? <laughs> yes, yes, students, wave your arms. I'll think you're so happy. I won't even realize it's a break. All right, so this first session, uh, this morning before lunch, we're going to be talking about, I'm going to give you a, a brief introduction, a PowerPoint in just a minute. 
uh, after I get through doing this introduction. But anyway, we'll talk about, in this first session, the idea of how people, we'll ask the question how various people have suggested we could define species. Okay? This always comes up. And let me tell you what the answer is going to be from me. I don't know. Okay? I know how I do it, but I don't know how you'll do it. So what, and, and if you think that's like, well, pfft, geez whiz, you're supposed to be the expert in this. By the way, if my wife was here, she would have been retching. My, my, my family is very supportive, but they also are very realistic. So when everybody says, he's the world expert, they're like, yeah, you haven't seen him at home. So, but I appreciate it. It was sweet of you. So what we're going to do, though, is we're going to go through from, from Darwin. We're going to talk about what his species concept was. Ernst Myers, Joel Craycraft, and Alan Templeton. You may notice there are no, quote, unquote, early, sorry, recent papers here. Many, many recent papers on species concepts. Uh, my 2016 book that just came out, obviously, has a bunch of new papers. So why would I give you old ones? Well, because there's two reasons. Number one, these were foundational papers or reviews. Okay? Number two, these were actually, looking at them, are indications to you that you need to Oh, thank you. Yeah, I know. I forget. I do this all the time. I use my arms. Um, these are also, though, indications that I want you to think seriously about reading older literature. Literature did not begin 10 years ago, okay? Whatever 10 years ago is for you, all right? Literature did not begin 10 years ago. What Darwin said is incredibly important today. Uh, he's the foundation on which we build a lot of our research. A lot of our actually detailed research, not just general concepts. Okay, Ernst Meyer, I don't agree with much he wrote, and he was foundationally important in the field of evolutionary biology, so we need to know what he was thinking. In fact, we'll have more things by Meyer than we do have by anybody else, which is interesting because I really do disagree with a lot of what he wrote. And then Joel Craycraft and Alan Templeton in this, in this 1989, almost 30 years ago, it's amazing, uh, text, it was a group of chapters on a couple of different species concepts, phylogenetic species concept and what Alan Templeton called cohesion species concept. Now, why wouldn't I tell you, okay, this is how you should you should define species. Well, we'll talk about why I won't do that. But one of the reasons is there's about 127 or 8 specifically different species concepts out there. Okay? And when I teach this course at my own university, used to, I would give them 10 or 12 species con different species concepts papers to read. And by they were all graduate students, and Americans can be quite aggressive, and by the end of about number six, they were ready to murder me because they said, why are we reading all these? And I realized they were right. Why are we reading? Because I can't give them 120, I wouldn't want to go through 127 myself, but I wouldn't give them enough to really say, look at all the variety, but rather just to give them and you an introduction to how some people suggest with some of the major species concepts and or the ones that I think are important, whichever way. Okay, and so next, after lunch, we're gonna talk about something called the modes of speciation, okay? Species concepts is the classic way people talk about species definitions. That's the terminology. Modes of speciation just means how do people suggest that species can form? What might be the processes that cause it? What might be the factors that are needed to have species, new species form? New evolutionary lineages. How might it happen? Does it always have to be in geographic separation, i.e. allopatry? Can it be sympatric? What about ecology, et cetera? And so this afternoon, this is what we're going to talk about, okay? And then tomorrow, and I forget because I'm also flying to Pune, but tomorrow, yeah, that's right, tomorrow morning, we'll 
go through this. And this is, I've titled it, Tempo of Speciation. Basically, what's the pattern? Can speciation be rapid? Can, does speciation always have to occur over very long periods of time with small incremental changes? Um, you know, does is speciation occur, does evolutionary diversification occur in pulses? You know, episodic is what I refer to it. Uh, or is it continuous? We're going to talk about several examples, including the classic on from Gould and Eldridge, classic from 1977, where they defined and discussed punctuated equilibrium, okay, from the fossil record. And so we'll look at that as well. Now, I think session four, yeah. So session four is the last one I'll give before we fly to Pune. And then I come back and I'll do session five. But session four and session five, I'll actually, these will be PowerPoint presentations to you. Uh, you don't have reading here, you might notice. You can take a breath. But I still want you to interrupt and ask questions. Here's, here's the other part of this. I, I always say this. I don't care if I get through every PowerPoint slide. Okay, if you interrupt and I get through a third of my slides, you interrupt with questions and I get through a third of my slides on one of these presentations and that's all I can do, that's fantastic. Okay, because we're covering topics you are interested in if we're doing that kind of interaction. So you, can, you don't have to interrupt, but I would love for you to raise your hand when I'm lecturing on any of this, even now, if you have questions. And I'll ask you occasionally, hey, do you have any questions? But please feel free to interrupt, OK? So anyway, session four and five will be me giving you lectures, introducing you to this, OK? Divergence with genetic exchange where we take over, where we, sorry, begin and, and use my book in session six, my new book in session six, seven, and eight, okay? And we will discuss various um, topics associated, uh, the newest terminology, and I'll show you in a moment in this PowerPoint, the newest terminology for uh, this kind of series of processes is called divergence with gene flow. Uh, I tend not to use that terminology. I turn, tend to use divergence with genetic exchange because very often divergence with gene flow is talking about eukaryotes only, plants and animals and fungi. And I'm really interested, as you will see as we talk about things and as I show you various kinds of examples, I talk and want to write how your viruses, how are prokaryotes and how are eukaryotes affected when genes are moved around. And it could be between viruses and humans, okay? The only reason we're sitting in this room right now is because of a retroviral insertion many, 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 many hundreds of millions of years, actually tens of millions of years ago into the mammalian lineage. It turned non-placental mammals into non-placental mammals and placental mammals, which we are placental mammals. The only reason we're here is because of that genetic exchange event and a lot of other genetic exchange events as well, because it allowed placentation. So those kinds of things make it impossible for me really to, to call it divergence with gene flow per se, because gene flow really harkens up sexual reproduction and eukaryotic kinds of genetic exchanges, which we will talk about extensively. So sessions six, seven, and eight are that, all right? Any questions before I, I show you this introductory PowerPoint? Any questions at all? Why am I here? If it's complaints, that's for Hema and Murdy, actually. It's not my fault. Any questions? Okay, that's all right. We'll get you warmed up, I promise. This, this is how it always starts. All righty. So, let's go. Let's see if this will, okay. All right, so, as I mentioned, um, there's a lot of different 
there are many terms for what I, we're going to be talking about. And evolutionary biologists, just like every other scientist and ecologist, we tend to like to invent new terms so that it sounds like what we're working on is brand new. And quite often, if you laugh, it's true. Man, it's so true. I had a nature paper I was writing. I didn't get it. I've never had a nature paper, by the way. But I had a, a nature paper I was writing years and years and years ago on this brand new phenomenon that I had discovered for the very first time in human history. Fortunately, at the time, I was also teaching undergraduate evolutionary biology, and we were using Origin of Species as a supplementary text with our undergraduates, who, by the way, wanted to murder us for assigning that. They hated it. I don't know. But anyway, so we said, okay, great, but we're going to do it anyway. So I'm reading through Origin of Species, and I'm madly working on this beautiful nature paper that's going to make me incredibly famous. And I ran across a quote in Darwin uh, in his Origin of Species that described what I had been thinking was brand new to the perfection. In fact, I used the quote in my paper, which I, of course, no longer sent to Nature, but expanded it out and got it published in Evolution. But it, the, the fact of the matter is that we do invent terminology sometimes as well. So these are all terms that are associated or could be used for something I call the web of life. I named it, we coined the term web of life back in, I think, 2004 in an in a article. And what I was trying to say was, and I'll show you what the web of life is in a moment, but what I was trying to say was that in terms of hybrid speciation, intergressive hybridization, non-allopatric speciation, parapatric sympatric speciation, and divergence with gene flow could sort of be summarized. They could be plopped into a bucket, a container, called the web of life. But a lot of other things having to do with genetic exchange could, could as well. Okay? Now, let me digress for a moment. When I'm giving PowerPoints or when we're talking, okay, when we're discussing things, if I happen to mention, say, a paper, not, not of mine necessarily at all, but I mean of someone else's, you'll see I give a reference on the bottom of slides. If I do that and you see one and, and it's referencing something that you're interested in, you think, hey, that might be useful for me, drop me an email, okay? I am. I was on, I don't know if you noticed that photograph that I had taken of the Himalayas last year. We were on a 10-day trek in the Himalayas. We went up to about 5,000 meters. It was wonderful. And I was on email while I was doing it. It was pathetic. And so it, when we would stop at tea houses, I would get onto my email and do stuff. And my wife said, you know, you are on holiday. And I said, yeah, I realize, and I would just keep working. But if you, if you see something, or if you want to try to set up, I, I I mean, my schedule's a little tight, but not horrible. There are some times probably that we might be able to meet up, but you know, it's some time for, I don't know what we're doing for lunches every time, but maybe over lunch or something like that if you, if you want to chat. That's why I'm here, and I really love that. I love talking to people about their research or questions or whatever in an informal setting. So you can talk to him or Murdy, but it's probably you know, you can just email me and say, hey, can we get together sometime? And then I can talk to him and say, when am I free, kind of thing. Hema? Uh, so I just want to mention that lunch is right here with Mike and everybody having lunch here. So you can spend time to talk about whatever. See, uh, there is a morning coffee break at 11, 11 to 11.30. Again, we've kept it long intentionally so that you have time to discuss. And the afternoon coffee break is again for half an hour. Thanks for reminding me that I had to take a break. But yes, very well done. So anyway, if you see something and want to email me and ask me to send you like a PDF or something like that, please do. However, <laughs> and I gave this example in China, just this last one, please do not write me and say, hey, Mike, would you send me the papers you discussed yesterday? Because I discuss a lot of papers yesterday. So, so make sure you write down some details, like on the slide, or take a you know, photo with your phone, or whatever you want to do. If you have something, 
and just ask me, but give me some specifics because I really won't know what you're talking about. If you just if you generalize it, I'm gonna I won't send you 30 PDFs, even if you ask for them, probably. But I will send you stuff if you need it. Okay, so with this idea of speciation and the web of life, then the conceptual framework and shameless advertisement. So I'm going to tell you right now what our framework has been, what my framework, I guess, has been since about 1982 when I moved to Australia to work on grasshoppers. Uh, and we were looking at intergressive hybridization, hybrid zone evolution, that sort of thing, and these really cool organisms that I'll talk about a little bit during this, this uh, my portion of this course, of this workshop. So what is our framework? Well, I'm going to use the four books that I've published to give you an idea. So our framework is that natural hybridization is important for evolution. This one came out in 97, this particular book. It was the first one I, I'd been asked to write. And so the idea there was it's important. I, I, I sort of tried to spell out why it's important for plants and animals, but really only in terms of diploidy. Okay, so very limited, very limited amount of space that I had, and so I limited the topics. But then our lab has moved on, and my review papers and books have moved on. This is one of the ones that Hama mentioned, Evolution Through Genetic Exchange. And this was in 2006, and the I, and 10 years later, I really wanted to talk about viruses and prokaryotes and plants and animals and also polyploidy, for heaven's sakes, which I hadn't, hadn't spoken about in the first book, which is, of course, incredibly important uh, in both plants and animals. You guys, all of us in this room, are polyploids. I mean, we are at least probably hepta if we're not octoploids, okay? And so throughout the vertebrate lineage, we've had a lot of whole genome duplication events, and uh, many of those are probably allopolyploid events, hybrid, hybridization events. So this is actually a book that nobody knows exists except myself and my mom, I'm convinced, and maybe my family. Uh, but I published this in 2008, 2009, Reticulate Evolution in Humans. And I'll, you'll actually see this cover a number of times because I'm going to use us. What I did in this book was I used humans and their ecological setting, our associated organisms. If you're wearing cotton right now, I'm guessing most of us are. It's at least part of the web of life at one time because it's an ancient allopolyploid that we then domesticated, okay? So this idea of genetic exchange and admixture and all is in, is in the clothes we're wearing. And then secondly, if you have the cotton that we use in the US, it's doubly web of life kind of uh, organism because we have GM'd it all over the place, right? So we have caused part of the ad addition to the web of life. But this book talked about those kinds of issues and also talked about how we may have originated. And we'll talk a lot about that in here. OK, very recent. And I'll show you actually some data right now. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I say my mom knows about this. But I'm really being sort of sarcastic. She and I are really good friends. But she's also a creationist. And so uh, when she, she thinks I'm going straight and surely to hell, and I tell her I'm not, but that's OK. Uh, and so she, I like to send her my books. <laughs> it's really mean, I know. It's like, show them to your Baptist friends. This is fun. So, uh, but I'm, I'm not a good son, apparently. Um, this is the last one that, and this is the one that Hama mentioned. This is the one that, and I've mentioned that I just came out with, Divergence with Genetic Exchange. I sent them photos, by the way, as another digression. I sent them photos of my plants, which are beautiful, uh, beautiful irises, which you will see photos of. And I also asked friends from around the world to send me photos of organisms that they work on. On the back of this book, there are hares, and there's Ipomopsis, another plant that's in North America. Uh, that a friend of mine works on. Anyway, they chose the hares, the Ipomopsis for the back of the book, and they chose Ola Seehausen, who's in Switzerland. They chose his Great Lake, African, East African Great Lake cichlids for some strange reason over my plants. That's eh, a pretty, it's a pretty picture. And they're, these are hybrids. These are part of the adaptive radiation through hybridization, so it's okay. So that's our conceptual framework, though, that we work with, that I've been working on since, you know, for 30, 
four years or so, the idea that genetic exchange, genes moving around in various ways, have been evolutionarily, foundationally important. Okay? Um, and the argument now can be made that it is probably very unlikely that organisms ever, any organisms ever, diverged in complete allopatry. All organisms, almost all organisms, if not all organisms, actually have exchanged genes with some other organisms during their evolutionary history. And often that's with relatively closely related organisms. And so it's just vanishingly improbable that you have a single origin for a plant or an animal. It splits geographically into two populations and then never sees the other related lineage okay, before it actually reaches complete post-zygotic reproductive isolation. But on top of that, we have quite a bit of genetic exchange that is associated with other kinds of events. Like, we have natural hybridization, and I generally talk about natural hybridization, intergressive hybrid, hybridization, or intergression, hybrid speciation, etc., within eukaryotes. And viral recombination, obviously, that speaks for itself. Horizontal gene transfer, and this is where it's becoming messier, okay? Five years ago, I asked, uh, we have an institute of bioinformatics at my It's very famous. Uh, the lead center is just absolutely fantastic world. She just had a news and views, I think, in science or whatever, talking about something. And anyway, I asked her, I said, do we have prokaryotic, we have viral sequences all over our genomes, okay? Retroviruses, various kinds of viruses, and that, that's been known for a long time. Lines and signs, I mean, we've known about that for, for probably a couple of decades now. But I said to her, do we have prokaryotic? And she said, I don't know yet. We don't know yet. We said there's some evidence, but she said we need to get more genomes. And now it's just understood. You know, a simple five years later, it's understood that our, our genome is pockmarked. It's with various kinds of different organism DNA. And part of that DNA is prokaryotic. And some of that is incredibly important. Maybe it's uh, trying not to wiggle my arms. I'm not sure if it's me doing it or that's okay. All right. And so the messiness here is that horizontal gene transfer can be, is now sometimes used for what I would call natural hybridization or intergressive hybridization. Horizontal exchanges between closely related plants or animals that are hybridizing with one another. I try to keep these actually apart from one another, um, but it's hard because they're really melding together now. And in a good, I mean, for me, that's great. That means that the whole idea of this web of life actually becomes more and more significant, if you will. But this is, instead of a tree of life, and I'll show you a tree of life, uh, Darwin's and another one later on, not in this introduction. This is the kind of thing we're talking about with the web of life. This was a, a illustration by Doolittle. Uh, he published in 99. I think I showed this last year when I was here, actually. And it, it's a nice illustration because he's trying to show you uh, through this that through evolutionary time, starting down here all the way up, you have these kinds of genetic exchange events, okay? I mean, these are not hypothesized genetic exchange events. These are actually known genetic exchange events. The, po the problem with this whole deal here is that it's just not reflective of the complexity. It's not reflective of the extent that genes have been moved around through evolutionary time. It is not a tree of life. It has some tree-like aspects, and we can present it as a tree of life by ignoring all this. But I would argue that ignores a vast majority of what was important for adaptive evolution and, and lots of different kinds of organisms. And so, and this, of course, does not also, it does not connect to any of these up here, which it needs to, to show the real complexity. So the web of life, and I'm just going to put all of these up here now. The web of life 
as opposed to the tree of life, once again, I'll, I'll juxtapose these later in a more detailed talk on this, but the, the web of life is both divergent and convergent. The tree of life is thought of as only being divergent, and very few times, vanishingly infrequently, do we think of it as being convergent, okay? But instead, with the web of life, with all this gene genetic material being moved around, there's constant convergence throughout the tree. I'm not talking about that we end up with one form. Obviously, that's not true. It's diversifying because we have all these different kinds of forms of plants, animals, viruses, prokaryotes up at the tips right now that we can look out here in this beautiful scenery and see. Okay? But the thing about it is that because we are exchanging genes, we become somewhat like the organ, the recipient becomes somewhat like the organism that donated the material. Okay, we'll talk about wolves and dogs in North America and in Europe. Gray wolves are now black and gray or light colored in North America. Why are they black? Because they have dog genes in them. And it was an adaptive trait integration. Okay, same thing has happened in Europe. And we'll talk about why we call it adaptive trait integration. But those sorts of convergences and repetitions, which this is related to this. So we used to think of evolution as non-repetitive. It just would not repeat itself. But with the work of people like Dolph Schluter, Ola Seehausen, the Grants with their finches, uh, people who have looked at island speciation and plants, uh, obviously in prokaryotes that transfer cassettes of genes around, and you see the same antibiotic resistance, for example, popping up all over, that's repetition, that's convergence, right, because of gene transfer. And then, so it's often repeating. So overall then, instead of divergence, branch-like divergence, tree-like divergence, with no genes moving across, no branches coming back together and connecting, instead of that, we have divergence with genetic exchange. And that's what we're going to be talking a lot about. Okay, This is the paradigm I want to show you why people are so interested, why there's this whole industry now of divergence with gene flow. It's because of data. It's because people have put together data, mostly genomic, but not only genomic, but mostly genomic, and they've been detecting bits of DNA that shouldn't be there, quote unquote. Okay? Just uh, every time they get a new genome. So what we're going to then emphasize is that in terms of eukaryotes in particular, are reproductive isolation and genetic exchange. But if we expand the terminology reproductive isolation to just being non recom non recombination, then we can talk about viruses and prokaryotes as well. So if we just talk about this as not transferring or transferring material or not transferring material in terms of isolation, then these terms, I would argue, and these processes are two sides of the same coin. So if you take one of your coins here and you look at one side, it's something, and you flip it around, it's something else, but it's still the same coin. That's what I mean by that, by that particular phrase. Now, what I, we mean, though, are by being portions, sorry, two sides of the same coin, is that portions of genomes, so you have two genomes that can interact. They can be, once again, viruses, prokaryotes, plants, or animals. They can interact in terms of they could transfer material between their lineages through whatever, you know, transduction, transformation of its prokaryotes, viral reassociation, or in our case, sexual reproduction, okay? They could do that, but portions of the genome are actually isolated from one another. So let's talk about animals. You form an F1 hybrid, okay? That first filial generation hybrid between two divergent individuals. You form that, and in meiosis, you can have recombination spread throughout your genome, that particular genome. But what you find coming out the other end in the gametes are that portions of the genome were not able to recombine, or if they did, that must have meant that the gametes were inviable, if there was a recombination event there. So portions of the genome are isolated, but portions of the genome are permeable. This 
this permeability comes from that terminology comes from a paper back in 1968 by Ken Key in Systematic Zoology. And he was talking about species boundaries being semi-permeable. What he meant was that when you had overlaps in nature, okay, between divergent organisms and they hybridized, some material could get across, some genetic genomic material could get across, and others couldn't. It was like a cell membrane is what he was doing. It, that was his analogy, his metaphor, cell membrane. Some passed across as if it was neutral, like saline solution or something like that that just passes through the pores. Some could not pass a across the membrane. It was stopped. It was blocked by the membrane. That would be the portions of the genome that are isolated. They cannot recombine and form uh, those kinds of recombinant gametes or those kinds of recombinant individuals. And then some of it, though, was not neutral, but rather it looked like it was actively pulled across the membrane, quote unquote. It was actively pulled in and it went to a very high frequency on the other side and that's called adaptive trait transfer, depending on the organism you're talking about, if it's animals adaptive trait integration, okay? And so we would argue, and others do as well, that this differential permeability, some being isolated, reproductively isolated, some not, differential permeability is often due to differential fitness of hybrids across time and phenotypic space. And so what we mean here is like I said, in the F1 in particular, let's use it as an example, some gametes just don't work. Some recombinant gametes are inviable, okay? And so you get this kind of differential fitness throughout the gametic phase, but also in the zygotic phase. And we'll talk about that as well. So we're going to talk in terms of theory and data analysis in the context of animal plants, procure goats and viruses. Uh, in particular, as, you, as we get into my, this book, you will see a lot of examples. We'll even talk about species concepts associated with prokaryotic individuals, prokaryotic types. So we'll, we really will go across the board, across the gamut of uh, trying to understand more and more about this quote unquote new paradigm that we have floating around out there. Okay, you will get so tired of this species complex because I'll talk to you a lot about it. These are three of the four species in the species complex that we have focused on in my lab. It's not the only thing we've worked on. We've worked on fire ant, solenopsis, we've worked on fungi, we've worked on trees, worked on a lot of different organisms in my lab, and I'm also publishing a lot with primatologists and things like that. So it's not the only thing we've worked on, but we have a lot of data. We started working on these guys in 1988, and so we have a lot of data built up, and I'll use them as an example, these, these particular species, example of whole genomes demonstrating complex patterns of reproductive isolation and genetic exchange, this kind of semi-permeability. <laughs> We'll talk about that kind of information using these guys, but also other organisms as well. And also what might be the causes of the patterns of genomic and phenotypic evolution that we see in our plants and animals that we've worked on and others have worked on. And as I said, we'll talk, yes, 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 yes. Yeah, so the question is, so the, you're, you're asking, is there a time limit, basically, for genetic exchange to occur? Uh, the short answer is no, uh, but let me, let me tell you what I mean by that, because that's an excellent question. If we think about, let me, I'm going to step and see if I can do this. If this goes nuts, I'll turn this off for a moment. Oh. Okay, so if we think about this for a moment, and you're going to laugh at me for drawing a tree, but I still think phylogenetically because 
I did phylogenetic systematics with mammals for six years, and that's just basically, this is what I always thought of, and I still think of this, okay, even though I have something I call the web of life. But if we think about this particular kind of related, series of related organisms, then let's say it is mammals, then what we would say is in terms of sexual reproduction being the vehicle by which you would have transfer what we, we have two different studies that would suggest that it takes about four million years for mammalian species to build up post-zygotic reproductive isolation, right? Birds takes a bit longer. Um, and so in terms of sexual reproduction, we would argue, well, we, we cannot sexually reproduce with chimps and gorillas, even though we've been, and we've been diverged, say, four and a half, five million years. And so this would be a limitation. So why would I say there's no limitation? Well, that's just, though, for sexual reproduction, right? So we have those kinds of exchanges going on throughout this, so intergressive hybridization or hybrid speciation or whatever else. Of course, in plants, it's much longer. But we have all of these different kinds of sexual reproduction that we have transferring these. But then overlaid on top of this entire clade, regardless of what it is, are the insertions of other kinds of material that can go on between those organisms and viruses, bacteria, and, and so this whole kind of, that, that's the thing that I, we have just been so naive and ignorant about, I, did, I was, but I never thought about the fact that we as a lineage would have been so profoundly affected and mammalian lineages and plant lineages, et cetera, would have been so profoundly affected by insertions of, of non-sexually reproducing insertions. And so that's why I say no. I mean, we're going through an a episode right now which is horrible for so many people around the world, but HIV infections are exactly that kind of a transfer, right? And so those folks who are, are resistant, very vanishingly few folks, but those folks who are resistant are taking in new DNA from a viral source that may very well do something else, just like we've had millions of years ago that gave us additional innate immunity in our system. So, but it's a very good question. Yeah. Um, and t you mean how different in terms of whether or not they can exchange genes? Because of genetic exchange, though. Um, so here's, here's what I would argue, and, okay, so let me take a step back and tell you a little bit more about who I am. So I have a very good friend uh, at Indiana University named Mike Wade, a friend there. And Mike works on models by a person and is very intent on working and, and exploring models proposed by a person called Sewell Wright. Okay? And Sewell Wright really emphasized genetic drift. There is a point to this, <laughs> by the way. I promise you there's a point to why I'm answering it in this way. I don't think about genetic drift hardly at all. Okay? I don't think about random sampling. But that does not mean that that is not a fundamentally important process during evolutionary di differentiation. So that's what I need you to hear, because we're actually going to talk about genetic drift in one of these papers, and tempo speciation papers. All right, now having said that, I am a pan-selectionist, pan-adaptationist. I, I really think about <coughs> natural selection and adaptation almost 24-7 when I'm thinking about my work and thinking about these review papers and books. So what does that mean? Well, what it means is when there are genetic exchange events, I'm not thinking about how it might draw those organisms back together per se. I'm actually thinking about how it may lead to evolutionary novelty, new adaptations, new evolutionary lineages, new combinations that give rise to things that we haven't seen before, organisms. So within a genus, if there is genetic exchange, 
take the wolves and the dogs, that adaptation being transferred didn't, didn't actually disrupt the wolf genome or the wolf phenotype per se, it gave us a new kind of wolf that was actually adapt, more adapted than the light-colored wolf to some environments. So, so th it's sort of hard to say how different will they be? Will it really draw them back together? Now, does that answer your question? Yeah. So it's a great question about bacteria. So l let me tell you an anecdote. Um, every time I have an evolutionary, we have Doolittle, and we, you know, we've had lots of these different, really huge named uh, evolutionary biologists who work on prokaryotes come through our department, and I always ask them, what is the limitation? to genetic exchange among prokaryotic lineages. Can anything transfer? Can everything transfer? Is anything ever neutral? Is anything ever maladaptive? Because if you read the nature papers and science papers uh, on you know, newest genome of X, Y, or Z, and, and they talk about the cassettes of genomic material that have been put in there, it's always adaptive, right? It's always adaptive for them. So. Um, when we sequence, however, many of the evolutionary biologists who work on prokaryotes argue that do phylogenetics, quote unquote, argue that you're just never going to be able to draw any kind of a well-resolved tree for prokaryotes. So in that sense, they're drawn together, okay? They are, there is no resolution for that. But, but really what they mean is they're trying to understand the bits that are transferred and the bits that aren't. And that's, that's really what they're trying to do. And so with prokaryotes, it's a bit more difficult to some degree. But it also more than... Well, it's the reason they use ribosomal RNA to do all of their phylogenies. For some reason, the ribosomal RNA genes are not transferred. And so that is one, one piece of genomic information that maybe doesn't give them a web. So what we will be doing, which is within this, is we'll talk a lot about this, you know, why do we have different species if we have these kinds of genetic exchange events? And I would argue, once again, as a pan-selectionist, pan-adaptationist, it's because of linkage disequilibrium. In other words, genes are being held together by natural selection, and you end up with a, a phenotype, different phenotypes, even though they are sharing genes. They may be sharing a lot of their genome, but you have natural selection continually selecting for a constellation of phenotypes and adaptations. I think there's good evidence for that. Great questions, by the way. This is exactly what we have to do. Perfect. This is, this is already great. Yes. Did you have something else you wanted to ask? Yeah, so correlation of genome size. We, we talked about this. Actually, one of the students um, in China asked, we were, we were going round and round about this in a good sense, about genome size and limit, just genome size limitations in itself. Um, can, are there genome size limitations in plants or animals? And there are a number of different theories on that, obviously, you know, uh, architecture within the nucleus and things like that. Um, so we have not, because of the way organisms can, can get rid of DNA very effectively, and also because they can blow it up and seem to deal with it very effectively, particularly plants, but animals as well. I have not seen a correlation that I could pick out when I look across genome sizes, say in the Kew Gardens genome size database that they put together for plants. There, and, and, and in other words, Smaller genomes more likely to, hi you know, intergressively hybridize. Large genomes not. It doesn't look like that's, well, I mean, ours is huge. Well, no. 
No, they corrected me when I gave a talk at Q Gardens, and I said we have a, it's 10 gigabases or whatever, and it's mostly retro elements, just like all plants. And um, they corrected me and said that's not huge. Said, really? They said no, that's not big. That's not. Anyway, but it's it's large, and so we have a lot of integrative hybridization going on. Okay, we're doing fine. Anything else? Yes. I, I'm so sorry. Yeah. 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 So, is the transfer of this prokaryotic genome to eukaryotic one, the viruses, is it a random one or is a non random one? See, what I, th uh, yeah, it's a wonderful question. Is it random or non, non random? It, do you mean insertion points or do you mean the type of material or do you mean both? Both. both. <laughs> Thanks. So, um, it's, it's a wonderful question. So, the answer is, we don't know yet. So this is one of those, I mean, I sure don't know, but this is something that I ask, once again, my bioinformaticians. What we can say, see, we don't know the things that didn't get in, right? And we don't know the things that were lost just by chance. Uh, what we can, what all we can say right now is that they do tend to accumulate at times, like viral sequences, uh, lines and signs, those sorts of things, retro elements, they do tend to occur near centromeres and telomeres, for example, right? Heterochromatic regions, so building up those highly repeated sequences. So in that case, it's non-random where they are. But really, more often than not, and those are big effects because it keeps recombination down, it can tally genes together, you can end up with co-adapted gene kinds of com kinds of co-adapted gene complexes near the telomeres or centromeres because you have that you know, suppression of recombination. So those are important. But the ones that people have really studied, because it's, it's difficult, okay, when people say that they've sequenced a genome, that's sort of true, okay, seriously. Because they haven't assembled the entire human genome. Never, ever, ever. And why is that? Because there's like, whatever, 30, 40% repeated elements and we don't assemble those because they're really hard to put back together. <laughs> they look alike and you don't know which, is this A or is that A or is this B, you know. So, so just so you know, it's, it's really generally gene space. And it's the stuff around genes that we're, we're genome sequenced, okay? Still very important. I'm not cutting it down at all. It's, it's a great thing that what we're doing, especially, I love it. I love those data. But what I'm trying to say, why I'm saying that is because we're not really sequencing in those heterochromatic regions, we're not exactly sure if there's some kind of a signal in there per se. And so what we do know is when we run across them in gene space and regulatory elements and those sorts of things that where we go, ooh, when that inserted, it caused this kind of a gene function change. And so we, don't, we just don't have the comparative data yet, I would argue, to know um, if it's, well, yeah, if it's random, I guess. I don't think it's, it's not gonna be random what's saved. It's like the semi-permeable membrane. It's not going to be random per se that way. Go ahead. And was it adaptive? Can we say that, like, they took the shelter in the genome so that they can colonize the genome and do their own survival? Yeah. Can we say like that, or it just happened to be? Like yeah. So, y do you mean basically adaptive for the in the insertion element itself? Yes. Yeah. So, of course, Dawkins suggested this selfish gene kind of a, a premise or hypothesis many, many decades ago, actually, now. Um, and yes, we can see good evidence that the kinds of events, like unequal crossing over, gene conversion, that these elements can drive, they can, they can cause by being there. Uh, because of the LTRs or whatever in the transposable elements. There's a lot of different processes, mechanisms by which they can do this. Those kinds of processes really do drive their evolution, their, their expansion and their contraction. But the genome at the same time is obviously working against having 
some of those elements because it's, it's actually removing them as they go. So is it adaptive? Was it adaptive or selfish for the, tra the, uh, the elements that, yeah, that came in? You know, that's, that's the way it's been modeled. What I tend to do is I also, I studied highly repeated, I studied highly repeated elements for my PhD and my postdoc uh, on the grasshoppers. So I really love this kind of stuff. Uh, but I tend to now think about how does it affect, how did the insertion of those kinds of elements affect the recipient rather than the elements themselves? But you're exactly right. Is it adaptive for the elements? People argue back and forth of whether we can call it adaptive or just quote unquote selfish. I'm not sure there's a big difference because they're keeping themselves around so they we could actually give them a fitness value of some sort. It would not be a sexual reproduction fitness value, but great. Yes. Uh, so, uh, what I thought was you transfer that you see between the phyla, does that kind of push up the line for evolution in terms of how the moths are uh, In terms of the, what was the last thing? in which the different morphs would appear, like especially considering now that we have more anthropogenic pressure. Yeah. Like something like what happened to those uh, in London, the peppered moths that came out right. within a very few short yeah. span of time. Yeah, so um, so we'll, we're actually, we'll be able to talk about this. Can evolution be sp sped up? Can it be contracted? Can it be, yeah, can it be sped up? Can the tempo increase? Um, uh, and or in this case, can the tempo decrease in such a way that, like, because there's so much of sharing? Between yeah, them? what we what we seem to be seeing, and these are early days. Um, I'm going to have to rewrite this book in about five years at the most, because seriously, because it's just exploding still. But the in the, in the early days, what we're going, what we're going to talk about actually tomorrow, and then in the next day or next session is that it appears that the transfer, it appears that evolution is very episodic and rapid, and potentially like punctuated equilibrium. So that it's not long continuous acquisition of mutations over time, but rather the kinds of, which is probably what we should have thought, because environments change very quickly relative to evolutionary change, right? I mean, in North America, glaciers spread out every 15,000 years. Well, no one would argue from a Darwinian model that that was long enough to get post-zygotic reproductive isolation, right? So, so things are mixing and matching. Uh, so there's, there's not an evidence of extending the time or, or extending the tempo or slowing the tempo down when you have genetic exchange or admixture, it's always speeding it up, okay? And it can sometimes be very deleterious, though, for biodiversity. For example, uh, when you, we silt up a lake or we have eutrophication of a lake or a water system, often it will, because sexual selection breaks down, the fish will hybridize and it admix to the point where you lose biodiversity. But that's still speeding evolution up, if you will. I don't know if that makes sense. And then, of course, if it clears out, then they're pushed apart again by the selection again. So they can, and it's like Darwin's finches. You see that on the islands as well. But I would argue, I would argue that it's less, much less likely that it slows the tempo down, but rather it actually that admixture or mixing together, what you're basically doing is taking huge pools of new mutation, novel mutations that have never seen one another in a genome and putting them together. It's taking massive amounts of standing genetic variation is how we talk about it in population genetics, right? It's new mutations versus standing genetic variation. You have divergent lineages with different sets of standing genetic variation alleles and you're mixing them together. It's like having that many point mutations all at once. Most things, well, we would argue that we would think that most of those admixture genotypes would probably be maladaptive, but a number of them would not be. Uh, 
in terms of whether it can slow down the process what mm -hmm. I'm, uh, if we can just go back, like if we just think about sexual isolation sexual mm -hmm. reproductive isolation mm -hmm. in that case uh, what the classical view was that it takes builds up over time right mm -hmm. being allopatric and everything mm -hmm. so now if we have a lot of horizontal gene transfer between the things like what you mentioned was the uh, evolution of the placental mammals for example mm -hmm. so being so it takes much longer time for two say allopatrically separated populations to ever li it like takes much longer time for them to separate out into two species that is what i'm asking you oh in allopat i'm so sorry in allopatra yes yes that would be the theory anyway that uh, that evolution would be more darwinian like longer periods of time uh, with the accumulation of, and I mean that's what, uh, accumulation of uh, small changes over yeah, over Because the, now they're sharing more genes so they're taking a lot of time to diverge. Well, yeah, but they're not, but see that's not what we're seeing. Even in adaptive radiations, the sharing of genes is giving you, you're not drawing, you're not, what we don't see really is mostly or even the vast majority of time, what we're not seeing is a drawing together of organisms. What we're seeing is an allopatry. So let's let's draw it like this is how I think about it now because this has to we have to incorporate this. I'll let him get back to the back. <laughs> let me just move over here for a moment. So if you have as we assume the origin of, let's just think about it cladistically, but we have the origin in one particular geographic region of two from one progenitor, okay? And then at some point in time, their geographic ranges come back together, okay? And then you have this again, and this. And so just, it's gonna be very unlikely that they diverge stay diverged. The only time that this is going to be likely where it doesn't do this is let's say that they in, they're inhabiting mainland and island, right? But even that, the mainland is still going to have other things that it's associated with, right? As, and so is the island. And so, so it's still very unlikely unless they stay monotypic genera or something all the way along. They're going to have something they're interacting with. But, but what we see is, what, what we don't see is when they come back together that it slows phenotypic change down, but rather you have them diverging from one another. You have different, once again, standing genetic variation. When you put those together, it drives them back and they are allopatric or in sympatry. It actually feeds the system with those mutations that evolution needs to actually, and new genotypes, to actually progress, quote unquote. I know progression is not a great term for evolutionary biologists, but I think you know what I mean, to diversify. So what we don't generally see is the coming back together and staying back together or slowly diverging again, but rather the African rift cichlids, every one of those species clades those enormous numbers like 600 species in Malawi or whatever that they estimate now, every one of those flocks of species in every lake started out as a hybrid swarm now that they have the genomes. Every one of them was fed by rivering forms that were allopatric for a while, came back together and intergressed, and then when the lake filled, they dumped into there as an intergressed population. So and then you have all these forms. Now whether or not the intergressive hybridization was always causal in that, in that adaptive radiation, we're not sure. Malawi, there's very good evidence that it is because they've been studying that in a certain way to see whether or not the underlying two, the combinations of, of standing genetic variation might have driven that explosive radiation. But that's why I say, I'm not saying it'll never happen where it slows it down, I, theoretically it ought to. It's just that our data so far seem to indicate 
that that admixture, that mixing together of those ancient standing pools of standing genetic variation actually does a reverse. But I, I agree with you, it, sometimes it should. And we see it once again in conservation terms, like I mentioned about the fish that can't females can't recognize different colored males, you lose the biodiversity. It slows quote unquote evolution down in terms of having that divergence then when you release that and you have the selection again, then they explode back out again away from one another in very few generations. Yes? On the, what, what do you mean by the type? Secondary. Uh, time. Um, if, if, the, if those two allopatric species have diversified so much that uh, upon secondary contact um, <coughs> they, they are not compatible. Oh, yeah. Uh, then, yep. then they are already two species. Mm -hmm. uh, without a further uh, many secondary contacts, they may have already diversified. Yes. And also theoretically, it's possible that there's only one uh, novel mutation that drives two, uh, two species apart. Mm. Yes, and so here's the, uh, this may sound really controversial, but here's the thing. I, yes, it does depend on how long they're apart, but once again, the th mammals, herps, whatever, you know, let's just talk about animals for a while. The, th the idea or the, or the likelihood that you're going to have two lineages that diverge from one, geographically stay isolated for four million years is just vanishingly improbable because of climate change, right? I mean, it's just, it's just so unlikely. Uh, it's not that it won't happen, but it's so unlikely that we should have known better and realized that when coming out of the neo-Darwinian synthesis, that this idea that species could only arise in allopatry was, was not likely. But there were reasons, philosophical reasons, why they argued for that uh, because of their species concepts. So it does, it would depend, but the data right now, every time we get a genome in of whatever, fill in the blank, whether it's viruses, prokaryotes, plants, or animals, we see evidence <coughs> that they have genes from related organisms. And so that tells us something about, I'm not saying it's genes for everybody in their genus, it's not that, it's just that what it tells us is that this model is much more predictive and, and explanatory of what actually evolution biogeographically looks like and genetically looks like. It's, uh, and now, your other question, one gene keeping species apart, it's unlikely. But in sympatric speciation, you know, we argue for linkage disequilibrium that ties these genes together as if they were one. Uh, but uh, the species I'm familiar with, plants and animals, once again, when people are arguing about or talking about speciation genes, they're talking about genes that have a certain effect on reproductive isolation, right? And so every, so most of the genome can be transferred. So what I'm really interested in is not just the genes that actually can't recombine, but I'd really like to know what's happening to the rest of the genome while my red flower iris stays red flowered and my blue flowered or lavender flowered irises stay lavender flowered even though they're intergressively hybridizing and exchanging, and I'll show you the evidence we have for flood tolerance genes. So they stay looking like they are, but now the red, uh, the blue flowered can actually invade a flood tolerant er or flooded area. And so it, it brings them close together, but they still look different. So those are the sorts of the things. But I understand what you're saying. It's just, uh, it's interesting. But yeah, every time we, the genomic information has really just turned the field on its head. Let me say something, I know we're going to have to break in just a few minutes, and I'll, I'll hush, I promise, uh, for the break. But the one thing I want to emphasize is, I'm going to say a lot about genomics in here. I'm in the Department of Genetics. I started out my career doing studies, uh, first paper was in 1978, 
working on plants, naming a new plant species, doing chromosomes, what were called allozymes uh, or isozymes, uh, doing morphological, that kind of thing. What I don't want to give you the impression is, is that I think that genomic information is somehow the only way or the best way to go to answer questions in evolutionary biology and ecology. We have spent much more of our time, much more of our time, watching pollinators, uh, planting plants out into common gardens you know, that we had created out in natural settings, doing all sorts of eco-physiology kinds of experiments in the greenhouse and elsewhere. And the reason I say that is, is that I'm going to encourage you as we go through this, I'm going to say this again, but I'm going to encourage you that if you're building your career on something, that you try to, you, you gather in as many different kinds of types of information as you possibly can. And the ecological, behavioral, whatever kind of organism you're working on is going to dictate what you, you know, ecophysiology, physiology, whatever it happens to be, are most of the time much harder to gather. And most of the time are incredibly powerful ways to test evolutionary hypotheses and ecological hypotheses. An example is, and I'll mention this again, if Peter and Rosemary Grant, the ones who worked on Darwin's finches and still do, if they had not gone every year and sat on a lava rock island in the Galapagos, none of the genomics that they've now done on the regulatory elements of the beak shape and development would mean anything. The only reason it means anything is they have lifetime fitness uh, for birds across 40 years. And they're able to correlate all these ecological pieces of information they had, physiology, behavioral, with the genomics that they have now. Okay, I'm not saying if you're only doing genomics, you're doing something bad either. I'm just saying I'm going to speak a lot of genomics stuff here, but I want you to understand that I don't devalue the other. In fact, I, it's the hard stuff to get. It is the difficult thing to do, but it's, it's so important, especially if you can do it over a long period of time, you know, decades. And that's hard to do with our granting situation in the U.S. I don't know about here. It's probably hard to do here, too. Okay. I just, I know that was to the aside. Yes? Sorry, I might have missed it. So apart from genomics, what are the factors do you think we should look into for accounting for all the changes that we have? Like, apart from genomics, what are the factors do you want to stress upon? Like, you think we should stress upon mm -hmm. for accounting for these kind of speciation or divergence? So the genomics, once again, can really give us, uh, and we'll talk about this, they can really give us some good, obviously some excellent necessary estimates of exchange events. Frequency, when did they occur, timing of it, you know, using various kinds of methodologies. But what they can't really tell us is the, much anyway, they can't really tell us the effects or why they might be adaptive or neutral. They can tell us, we can guess whether or not or infer if they're maladaptive if they never get across, and they should. But in terms of the kind of evolutionary change that many of us are probably interested in, we're interested in how evolution occurs, but also you know, the underlying factors for biodiversification and ad adaptation, we need other things. Uh, we need other information. In my plants, uh, the flood tolerance, we had the genomes were all mapped and we knew where our markers were, hundreds and literally thousands of markers. Uh, but until we had our plants growing in a flooded environment and some died and some did not, we just, we didn't have the information we needed. So that's what I mean by that. I think that it, However, if you're PhD students, master's students, postdocs, uh, you have a limited amount of time. <laughs> you want to graduate, you want to get a job, and so you have to, you really do have to focus and say, okay, I'm going to have to use genomics to answer these questions. And later on, or I'm going to use my ecological studies to answer these questions. And I'm not going to worry about the genomics right now. Later on, I'm going to try to put them all together. 
Absolutely. We will take our break now. Thank you for the questions, by the way, and we'll come back and we'll putz around with this a little bit more.